Welcome to episode 62 of the Positive on Publishing podcast. This podcast aims to inspire you with information to allow you to pursue your creative life with a smile on your face. I'm your host, Dr. Katherine Guile. Learn more about my work at makeeverythingfun.com. My guest today is Dr. Mario Martinez. Dr. Martinez is a clinical neuropsychologist who specializes in how cultural beliefs affect health and longevity. He proposes, based on credible research evidence, that longevity is learned and the causes of health are inherited. He has studied healthy centenarians, yes, that's folks 100 years or older, worldwide, and has found that only 20 to 25% of their longevity can be attributed to genetics. The rest is related to how they live and the cultural beliefs they share. Thus, epigenetics is a key factor in a healthy long life. Dr. Martinez is the author of The Mind-Body Code, How to Change the Beliefs that Limit Your Health, Longevity, and Success. In this book, among other things, he explains why our immune system is not just a protector. Instead, it responds to ways in which we have been conditioned to perceive the world. Welcome to the show, Dr. Martinez. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I have to tell listeners and and watchers to this video that Dr. Martinez and I met at a recent conference where I attended your beautiful discussion about uh, the immune system and about factors that come into play in the mind-body system and how it's all related. And so I want to make sure that we go through that beautiful structure where we talk about emotional injuries and how they show up in the body and then the antidotes to that. So I'm putting a little uh, sort of sticky note on that part of our conversation, but I wanted to start with this uh, sort of the the genesis story, maybe the aha moment in your work. You've done so much research and you continue to do so, but what was the point at which you said, oh, I, I have to get this into a book to share with the world? Like most science, uh, it came out of uh, frustration and and helplessness about uh, what was available. And in doing many, many years of uh, clinical neuropsychology and psychotherapy, I found that that it's not just enough to be able to explain something to somebody and for them to make some changes. You can't just uh, say to somebody, look, what a beautiful day, get rid of your depression. It doesn't work that way. So, it, and of course, there are many wor- uh, ways of dealing with that. But I realized that, that there has to be a code between the mind and the body that, that is not just language, that it has more than that. And that was the, uh, the mini epiphany, I guess, that got me to write the book on the mind-body code. And then I started using it in my therapy and in my work, and I found that things were happening, things were changing. And, for example, um, what I found is that uh, I believe that the brain – pays much attention to anything that that's considered to be survival. It has that from way back from 200,000 years, at least of, of uh, modern homo sapiens. So anything that we repeat becomes important to the brain, whether it's good or bad. So that's a, an important component there that whatever we repeat, the brain will store that and say, and, and interpret it as this is an important thing for survival. So I must keep it in, in the awareness of, of, of the day because it's, it's important for survival. Then what cognition does, since it has that mindset already or that, uh, that terrain already, the cognition looks for evidence to support that. So then what we do is if we have a day that we say, oh, today is really going to be a bad day. Uh, I just don't like the way things are going and uh, life is need, really not that great. Then cognition immediately creates a selective perception that looks for that to happen. Evidence, quote, evidence, to support that the day is not a good day. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And what happens then is that as you're doing that, you're polluting your nervous, immune, and endocrine system by the information that you're putting out. Mm. Can I just pull out a fun nugget from that, Dr. Martinez? Um, I think it's important for listeners to realize that a book can be a support for other work that you provide to clients, meaning you can do more if you're in a therapeutic practice, for example, you can do more with your hours with your clients if you have a supportive tool. So what you're saying is your book actually became something that you could provide to clients so that you could see more progress with their therapy. Yes, like a resource, because as you know, every chapter uh, at the end 
has specific techniques to, to apply what you learned in the chapter. Then since it's a new paradigm, new paradigms have to have new language to, to get your cognition to a different way, different looking at the world. And there's a glossary with a new language, so you can apply it. Uh, and then there's extensive bibliography for people that want to go deeper into the science. But uh, yes, I see it as, a, as a, a book to read once and then have it as a reference to the work that you're doing. Even if you're for your own personal development, you can go to chapters. For example, you read the book and then three months later, you go to chapters uh, that have to do with relationships and you go to guardians of the heart or to longevity, depending on what's going on. So it's a, it's a book that's not to be read once, but to be kept as, as, a, as a text uh, or, or a uh, reference for the private journey of self, as I call it. <laughs> Mm, I love that. And I know that I'm going to be for, and it is true. Like when I was, you know, I was wanting to work on, especially with us being home right now and I've got my kids home and they're, they're older. And so it's about adult relationships. So actually last night I went and I read the, the, the chapter on relationships and kind of refreshed my thinking about how I can continue to work on that. And there's some new ideas in there, but I love what you were saying about how behavior change requires new language. I also love how there's a glossary at the end. And I wanted to also to talk about, so there's a languaging aspect to it, but you also mentioned earlier this body-based or somatic um, aspect to it. So explain to people that maybe aren't as familiar with this idea of um, the emotions living in the body and how through your research and your clinical experience have been able to kind of map it. If you, uh, if you look at a, what's called a functional MRI, which is a, a brain scan that has, um, that's showing what the brain is doing in real time at the moment, you can see that if you, if you create a new thought, there's some neural maps and some, some neurons that get together to create a neural map, but they don't last very long because it's just a, a thought that's coming from the left side of the brain and it doesn't have the evidence based or it doesn't have the embodiment that, uh, that, it, w- that it would have if you did. For example, if you say, I'm a good person, that you, you begin to see that, that neurons get together, I'm a good person, I'm a good person, but they don't last. They, uh, they kind of disappear after a while. Because that is just a word that you're saying without embodying it, meaning it, how you're landing the emotion and how you're landing the experience in your body. So for example, affirmations by themselves, I think, don't work very well. You, you it take 100,000 affirmations for something to sink in. I think a faster way to do it, if you want to do an affirmation, if you want to change something, you could say, I'm a good person. And then check your body to see what kind of body response you have to that particular premise. And if you don't feel like you're a good person, your body will respond in a, it'll give you a little bit of tension or your shoulders will will tense up. And what you do is you go there, you observe it, and you allow it to pass. And then you go, I'm a good person again. And you keep practicing that. But also what makes it happen is so you go to your archives, you go to your own memories, and you ask, when was the last time I was a good person? That's evidence. And that has emotional, psychoneurological components to it. It's not just an empty word. So you go back and you say, okay, t- yesterday I was really a good person. I was very good with my friend. Then you embody and say, how does that feel, what I did? Embodiment of how, do you, how does it land in the body? Then you begin to see neural maps actually getting stronger and going deeper. And to strengthen it even more, then for the rest of the week, you do evidence-based things that support that you are a good person. That changes what we call in neuroscience the, uh, the default mode, which is the way we look at the world. It's uh, the goggles that we use to look at the world. Mm, and I want to talk a little bit about that default mode network because it's been discussed widely in a lot of publications lately. I'm going to summarize a few things in terms of fun nuggets. And we've all heard that, you know, neurons that fire together wire together. But what you've talked about, Dr. Martinez, is that you can go further with that because, you know, when you're when you're thinking something and creating an affirmation, maybe you're creating those neural pathways. But what you're saying, which is kind of another fun nugget, is that unless you anchor them in the body, then you can't actually fully integrate that. It kind of reminds me of the work of, you know, Gabor Mate, you know, when the body says no, and then, um, you know, when the body doesn't lie. So there's that, like, I love that somatic, even Peter Levine and his work with the somatic experiencing. And then you went further to talk about how there's that affirmations, again, can't work unless they're anchored in the body. 
but the, the body mind system needs that evidence to continue to support the affirmations because why? And then we'll get into default mode because is that because what the, is that the answer is because the default mode network is such a strong network that it'll just take over if you're not constantly anchoring and it'll just go back to ruminations and what happened before and what might happen in the future. Is that kind of why affirmations don't work? Yes, and partly because of uh, it's not an integrated process. So, for example, we learn things with the psychoneuroimmunology. We learn a symbol, and that symbol has a nervous reaction, an endocrine reaction, and it has a, 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 a um, immune reaction. So it's a cluster. So if we want to change that, just by using the language, it's getting a piece of the, uh, of the cluster and not getting to the total cluster. So you're not changing the cluster. You're just getting into it and not really making a, a significant change because you're not getting to all of the ingredients. And you just, you, you just mentioned a big word that I'm familiar with, but I want to make sure that the listeners are familiar. Let's kind of break this down because it is the ingredients to support change um, in the whole mind-body system. And that's psychoneuroimmunology. It's a big word. And I'm, yes. I'm, I'm looking at the roots of the word, and I know that this is, this is your area of expertise. So can you break that word down for us and how we can potentially even at this point, lead into those systems that you talked about at the conference that I attended, which, um, which has these um, injuries to the mind-body system and these beautiful antidotes that you describe in your book, along with practices, integrated practices to support it. But psychoneuroimmunology, can we break that down for, for viewers and listeners? Yes, it's, it's, a, uh, it's really an interdiscipline. It was um, created by my mentor, George Solomon at UCLA, and at first they call it psychoimmunology because he found that uh, psychological processes affect the immune system. Then later, Bob Ader came up with uh, the nervous system and saw psychoneuroimmunology. And then uh, uh, a, an endocrinologist also found, and they call it psychoneuroimmunoendocrinology. And what I'm doing now is I'm adding one component, not such a long word, it's cultural psychoneuroimmunology, which is really biocognition because Psychoneuroimmunology studies how your cognition and your emotions affect the regulation of the nervous, endocrine, and, and immune system. But it does it void of culture. And what I'm doing is I'm bringing the cultural component to how the psychological cultural process affects the immune, nervous, and endocrine system. And the way that I look at culture is that culture is all the things that are important in a collective belief. So for example, a culture is the collective beliefs that people share about aesthetics, ethics, wellness, illness, longevity, all things that are really important for survival and for meaning in life. So existential things, experiential things, transcendental things. So culture is a very important component of this. And if you look at the world as a potential to be interpreted, and we can only interpret the world based on, on whatever equipment we have. So as a human being, we can only go from uh, infrared to, ul to ultraviolet. That's all we can see. So that's not the world. That's our world. Because a, a snake would see infrared. A bee would see um, um, ultraviolet. And a bat would see uh, microwaves. So that's the, the equipment that we have. But then we are very different because we have a perception but that perception is based on the cultural components that we learn. So then you have that infinite possibility world. And what the culture does, it creates a fabric around that world. And we see the fabric is a way to interpret that. You see the fabric. So if, for example, if you're from a, uh, uh, a culture, that, and basically cultures are in, in general individualist or collectivist. So the Western cultures are more individualist, the individual is more important, the individual is the, the attention. And some Asian cultures are more collectivist where the, the group and the in, interaction are more important. And you can see how the brain is very cultural by, you can have people look at uh, a picture of, uh, let's say a man sitting on a bench at, at a park and you ask him to look at it for a few minutes and then you tell him, okay, I want you to remember and tell me all the things that you remember about that picture. And it's not universal. The individualist culture will see the man has a green shirt and he's wearing 
dark shoes, he's got brown hair, and he's got a, um, uh, a pipe. The, uh, uh, more of the, uh, for example, Koreans and, and Japanese and Asians will say, there's a man sitting there, there's a tree, and there's a squirrel there with the tree, and the man is looking at the squirrel. It's an interactionist kind of thing. So the brain learns to look at things based on, on, your, on your beliefs. And another one, the, uh, the prefrontal lobe, the, the medial prefrontal lobe, has to do with, with selfing, with, uh, with, with the concept of self, that and the insulin and other parts of the brain, but really the prefrontal lobe. So if you ask somebody when they were on a uh, functional MRI, when you can see how the, the brain is working based on the blood flow, and you ask them, talk about yourself, and that part activates. Keep talking about yourself, it activates. And they say, this is for an individualist culture. Um, now, talk about your mother or your friend. It goes to another part of the brain because it's not selfing anymore. But, and, and you would think, when I learned neuropsychology, that, well, that's it. It's a universal. That's, that's how it is for everybody. But then you go to an Asian culture and you ask them, talk about yourself. And that activates, that part like everybody else activates. But if you say, talk about your mother or your friend, it stays there in the selfing. So the self is a collective kind of mm -hmm. process. So the brain is culture, and then the immune system responds to the culture. So the immune system is cultural too. And that really is your, as part of your life legacy, is adding that cultural aspect. Yes. yes. It's so like the missing link of psychoneurology. Mm, it's beautiful. And I, and I want to dive into that, um, you know, so that just to summarize, you know, culture imp influences the way that we view and then perceive the world. And there's sort of two broad groups, that individual way or the collective way. And that actually impacts, you know, where things show up in the brain and then it can feed down into the immune system. And so maybe we could talk about that, that structure of these um, emotional mind body, um, we'll, we'll call them injuries, uh, which are the, you know, the shame, the abandonment. And then Dr. Martinez, the third one is, is, is even more serious. Remind me what that Betrayal. one is. Betrayal. Yes. Yeah. So, and, 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 and let first let's uh, describe for listeners and viewers what those injuries look like. And then what was so amazing. And I was, I think everyone in the audience was just spellbound on the seat of their chair about how that shows up in the body and people, I could see people nodding their heads and, and, and identifying. And I want listeners to realize that, you know, it doesn't matter if you think you had a great childhood, we all have injuries. It's just part of being a human being. And we can look at them as things that we are on classroom planet earth to, to work on. And that helps us to evolve. And so um, because we're talking about, you know, shame and abandonment and betrayal, you know, they sound like heavy labels, but all of us are working with these things because it's a way that we can grow. So be open listeners and viewers to thinking about where this might apply in your life. And I can tell you when I was in this large group of people, people were nodding their their uh, heads. And then in the breakout sessions, people were like, whoa, that was definitely me. And it was really good mm. to see how that was coming up in my body, you know, that shame and the heat and inflammation and, and then, you know, kind of talking about the antidotes. But first I'm going to let you go through those three because they're so powerful and listeners can just gently ask themselves to, to see if one might relate to them. Okay. Yes. I think they're very important. And what I found that the reason that I, and I call them archetypal wounds or or dampers of becomingness, dampers of becomingness. And what I found that every culture that I studied had those three, and then you could pretty much subsume everything under those three. I haven't found a fourth. Some, sometimes people will say, well, what about fear? Well, fear is a response to some kind of stimulus that could scare you, or fear of being wounded with one of those three wounds. So it's, it can be under, under those three. And then by looking at that, I thought, well, these, these are really important. And First, I studied them, and then I found ways to, in, to create the, the antidotes that you talked about. So, for example, abandonment is the most um, primitive of all. And the reason this happens is because all, even individualist cultures, the tribes want you to work for the, for the good of the tribe. And when you, when you want to individuate or when you want to become yourself, you have to get out of that. You have to do beyond the pale kind of things. And now beyond the pale has a negative connotation and, and it really, it, it shouldn't because it's getting out of the culture so you can learn about yourself. And in order to keep you within that space, either 
parents teaching you something or keeping you with what they believe is right or, or teachers, then they use one of those wounds or they use one of those dampers to keep you within, within place. The most primitive is abandonment. If you're a child and you're abandoned, you die. That's, that's very primitive and very important. And these things happen not just once because we're very resilient, but for example, it, it's a, a pattern of abandonment, emotional abandonment or um, intellectual abandonment, physical abandonment. And one example, the, the child is in kindergarten, all the mommies and everybody picking up the, the, the other boys and girls. And you see that your mommy's not there to pick you up. And then you begin to feel that sense. And it happens once, not a problem. But if there's a pattern of that abandonment, then you create that damper. You create that uh, stopping you from, from becoming self. And that usually feels cold. They, have, they, they each have a temperature and a psychoneurology to them. So the abandonment feels cold. And the reason it feels cold is an isolation, but you have constriction of, of, your, of your vascular system, which actually constricts and it, and it feels cold outside. And the feeling is a very strong isolation, a coldness, uh, and, and, uh, and a sense of disconnection from your social systems. And that usually creates a, uh, a psychoneurological reaction of stress, a lot of adrenaline and, and noradrenaline and then cortisol later, which actually do the constriction and that causes the immune system to, to um, suppress. The second one is shame, and this is used very uh, abundantly around the world. And shame is hot. Shame is a hot emotion. You know, when people are shamed, they turn red. And the feeling is a sense of profound embarrassment and a sense that you want the, 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 the earth to swallow you. And what you're having is you're having a reaction as if there's some pathogen out there, like an overreaction, like for, for an allergy. That's where you see the, the redness. And people actually begin to secrete, that's the one that's been studied the most, molecules that are called pro-inflammatory molecules that actually cause inflammation. So you see how biosymbolic the immune system is. Somebody shames you with words, but the words have a biosymbolic meaning, and you begin, begin to secrete tumor necrosis factor and um, um, interleukins 2 and other kinds of molecules that cause inflammation. And the, uh, the, the, the emotion comes later, it developmentally later. You, you can abandon a child at any age, but you can only feel shame when the child can see themselves in the mirror and identify that's me. Before, and some people say, well, I can shame my one-year-old. No, what you're doing is you're scaring them. You're not shaming them. You're shaming only when some, there's someone to shame. If there's no selfhood, then there's nothing to shame. They're just afraid what you did. And that's the second one. And the third, which is the strongest, is uh, the betrayal. And betrayal feels hot. It's red. You also have a vascular constriction, but it's different. Look how interesting. The vascular constriction makes you red and hot in the, uh, when you're dealing with, uh, with betrayal. And that same constriction makes you cold when you're dealing with abandonment. The same hormones and different, uh, um, I guess, uh, clusters show that differently. And the feeling that you have usually is anger, disillusionment. And actually you can show a with a child very easily. You could say, you could give him a, a promise of something. Do you like this crayon? Oh yeah, I like it. Okay, sing a little song for me. And then after they sing the song, oh, I'm not gonna give it to you. They're not shamed or abandoned. They get angry because they've been tricked, they've been lied to. And that gets red, it gets angry. And the psychoneurology also is that it's, it's a constriction, but it's a constriction that causes a lot of problems with heart and strokes and things like that. Not a cost, but a correlation. So each of them has a psychoneurology. Now, a correlation for each, but I want to warn that it's not a cost, only a clinical correlation. For abandonment, you see uh, an, an underimmunity. You see uh, a propensity for infections. Uh, and a propensity for even cancer. It's an underimmunity, hypoimmunity, a correlation, not a cause. Then for shame, which is that uh, inflammation, there, there's a strong correlation with autoimmune illnesses like fibromyalgia and MS and uh, 
other kinds of, uh, especially rheumatoid arthritis, uh, because of the chronic inflammation. And the uh, betrayal, which is an anger, and they can only affect you if you keep that as a chronic anger, as a chronic shame, or as a chronic abandonment uh, or, or betrayal. And there, there's a correlation with heart problems and, and uh, strokes, a correlation, not a, not a cause. So there's a strong component there that, uh, that shows you that uh, you have to come out of that so your default mode doesn't become a one of, of abandonment or, or, or betrayal or, or shame. Now, so after years, I, I thought, well, if there's a psychoneurology to this and if there's a reaction to this, a damage, there has to be an antidote. The, the, the body is very wise and there has to be an antidote. So I started looking into it and found that it, clinically, it, I, I found it to be very, very effective that uh, abandonment, the antidote for abandonment is commitment. Commitment consciousness to self because you were the one who was abandoned, not someone else. So it's not commitment to anyone else, commitment to yourself. And later you can commit to others. So commitment is, and I'll talk about that a little bit more, but commitment is really the antidote for abandonment. Uh, in fact, when you do it, uh, when uh, someone in, in therapy and they, they're in the abandonment consciousness and, you, and the technique that I use, and then you bring out the consciousness of, the, uh, of commitment, the body begins to warm up their hands begin to warm up. So there's a physiological response there. And then the uh, shame, which is one that's been studied the most with the uh, knowing the, the molecules that are secreted of, of uh, inflammation. With shame, I found that honor has an anti-inflammatory effect in my clinical work. And what I like to do, uh, we were going to do it in, in Uruguay before I left and never did, but uh, we're considering doing it here, is to look at the actual psychoneurological reaction to, to honor, to honor consciousness. I find it, I see that it works extremely well with fibromyalgia, with rheumatoid arthritis, and with other kinds of illnesses that have to do with um, inflammation. And, and I've worked with hundreds of fibromyalgia uh, myalgia problems, never found one who didn't have a strong shame wound. They all had some kind of inflammatory uh, wound or, or damping. Um, and the third, the uh, betrayal. Betrayal is loyalty to yourself is the antidote for it. And the good thing is that they don't have to be related to the, to the condition. It doesn't have to be related to the abandonment, uh, the commitment that you make. Any commitment that you make creates commitment consciousness and works on the wound or works on the, on the, on the particular um, problem that, that, that caused the, uh, the, the wound or, or what I call the damping of... Uh, dampers of uh, becomingness. So that's fascinating because uh, if you have something that doesn't work, you have to find something that works. Uh, and if you have something that, that's wounded, there has to be an antidote. So those three are really, really powerful. And in the book, I talk about it and I explain how to identify them. And again, you can't do it intellectually because when you're in beta uh, waves like we are now, the brain is protecting you from creating too much anxiety. So what we do is we use a technique of contemplativeness and go in there and then go to a theater that we create and go to the wound, bring it out, embody it, and then go to the uh, antidote, embody it, and it begins to clean it up. But then you have to begin to live the antidote. So if you're working on the uh, abandonment, then you begin to live in a consciousness of commitment to self and to others, but always to self. And you will find a lot of people will tell you when you're working with them that, oh, yeah, I have a commitment problem. I really have a problem with commitment. I just can't commit uh, because there's an abandonment. Uh, and I have a problem with honoring myself because they're shaming. It kills what would normally be a, develop, a developmental healthy process of developing commitments and, and honor and uh, a sense of loyalty. It kills it because it doesn't allow self to be valuable enough to develop those particular emotions. I want to tell you how much I admire your work, Dr. Martinez, and I, I wonder if our health system, if we could all understand, I'm a big fan of you know, collaborative or allied health practitioners, meaning we're all talking to each other. And instead of, you know, I go and see my physician for 15 minutes, and then I go and see my therapist for an hour, and then I, you know, it's all just sort of, um, you know, in boxes, like this I'm idea. Going shopping. You get yeah. the passion and the meat. <laughs> 
Yeah, but if we could all start to have conversations as healthcare practitioners and or, or just to have, say, physicians and other therapists and other healthcare providers, coaches, et cetera, understand what you're talking about. Because if that way, it's like really getting to the root of an issue. So if somebody comes in with you know, hypoimmunity, you know, they get sick all the time, you feel their hands and they're cold and, you know, there's vascular constriction. It's like understanding this um, emotional component can really help to, to provide a more holistic and supportive uh, treatment for the patient. And um, I want it because, but there was something so interesting that I, I, I cannot pass up, which was that we cannot heal in the beta wave um, state, which is, you know, our thinking and, and focus state but only in these certain contemplative states. So are you saying that we, um, are you suggesting that more of a like alpha theta state is where the healing exists? I just, I couldn't pass that, yes, as, that up without theta. asking. Yeah, and I think developmentally, uh, children up to close to pre-adolescence are mostly in theta waves. So they can, so they can uh, assimilate the information that you give them. Sometimes you tell them, look, you can fly. A three-year-old, you can fly, jump, and they'll jump because they have no no way of confirming or that, 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 and that's important because in those years you have to assimilate as much as possible. When you get to pre-adolescent, adolescent, you go to beta and they question everything uh, because then they have now a, a, an opportunity to challenge what you're doing. So what we do is we go to the alpha uh, theta, as you said, and then in that level, then the assimilation is better, but the preconceptions are kind of uh, allowed to, disappear for a moment so you can bring in the new um, information that, that you're creating in order to then come out to beta and, and apply it to beta. That's so helpful, Dr. Martinez, because I think sometimes people, I mean, and I believe this too, I, I don't think that you can think your way you know, through a deep wound. Like you can't think your way out of that problem. But then again, if you're working with somebody and they're, they're feeling anxious or they're feeling depressed or they're dealing with an autoimmune condition or all these different things that we talked about. And you say to them, you know, we need to get you to slow down. We need to get you to breathe. We need to get you to, to be mindful, to be in a meditative state. They'll go, you know, I, I'm too stressed. I'm, you know, I'm dealing with fibromyalgia. I'm de- you know, and then they're all like in that thinking yeah. thing, but what you're saying, this is the science behind why we need to take that time to slow down because we cannot heal in that hyper-focused state. In fact, it makes it worse, as you know, because it causes immune um, suppression. But the other component here, the important component is that knowing that these archetypal wounds or, or dampers exist and that they're antidotes, that is a very important ingredient to deal with embodied forgiveness. Because you, as you said, you, you, can't, you can't intellectually forgive someone. I forgive you because I'm a good person. I forgive you because, somebody, uh, because nobody's perfect. Those are intellectual expressions of something that goes deeper than that. So the technique that I use, as you know in the book, is that uh, you first, before you can forgive someone, you have to know what kind of wound they created for you. So if you have a bacteria inf- infection, you have to find out what uh, antibody you need or anti-biotics uh, um, uh, uh, that you need in order to deal with that particular bacteria. Same thing here. If you're, you, you say, I want to forgive him for what? Oh, he did some bad things. And what did that do to you? Well, it just hurt me. That's it. But if you go, this person shamed me incessantly, or this person abandoned me, then you have something to work with. And forgiveness has nothing to do with forgiving the person. It has to do as an act of self-love to release yourself from the enslavement that they created for you. And then at that time, you decide, do I want forgiveness with reconciliation or no reconciliation? You don't want reconciliation with a rapist. You might want reconciliation with your mother, but then you set limits different than the way that you were wounded from, by your mother. And there was an experiment that, that sometimes when you try to bring uh, social experiments into biology, it doesn't, it doesn't work really well. And what they try to do is they, uh, they brought women who had been raped and they brought them to the prison so they confront their, their, their rapist. And it, it was kind of set up so they, the thinking was that if you express all your anger and then the rapist uh, will uh, then uh, uh, ask for forgiveness and all that kind of thing, it'll be wonderful. But see, that was an intellectual cathar- and catharsis alone doesn't work either. So the women would go up to the man and they would say, uh, you raped me and you ruined my life and a sociopath 
which knows how to answer it, say, oh, you're right, I'm so sorry. You know, oh, how wonderful, they would cry. Uh, and then six weeks later, they would have panic attacks and they have all kinds of post-traumatic stress disorder because it brought something up in unfinished business. And the, re the reason they stopped it was that one day, this woman, again, does the technique and she says, um, you abuse me and you rape me and what do you have to say for yourself? And this guy was a, at least an honest uh, sociopath, if that's possible. And he said, well, the only thing that, I, that I'm missing is that as soon as I get out of here, I want to rape someone else and I want to rape you again. And then the woman's anger came out. So, so much for forgiveness. It, they stopped there because they realized that it just wasn't going anywhere. So you can't do those things. Forgiveness is a process that has nothing to do with a person, but with, with what they did to you. So for example, if you shoot somebody, it doesn't matter who you are or why you did it. You have to go to the emergency room and, and get that bullet out. That's what forgiveness is all about. And there's a technique, again, on the alpha theta, that you work through it, and you see that it has nothing to do with the predator. It has to do with your interpretation of how you were disempowered by the, by the predator. It's so important for people to hear that healing is more of a self process than an other process. And what yes. that does, Dr. Martinez, is it allows us to feel that we have more control. We have a, a large role that we don't have to rely on others in order to experience our healing. And, and I want to encourage people to be open-minded. There are a lot of people that think, you know, I'm fine. I had a fine childhood. Another, nothing really bad ever happened to me, but um, that's a little bit of denial. And I'm just inviting people to be open because at, again, at this conference, it was like, it was so beautiful to see people walk around and say, oh, that's why I've had cold hands and feet for my whole life. Or, <laughs> you know, that's why I always get sick. And then the other person would say, yeah, that's why I always feel really hot. You know, and, and when you start to be more open to the possibilities of these wounds or what you, you call dampers of becomingness, which is, which is, it doesn't make someone feel like they've been labeled. It just means that there is an opportunity for them to grow further. So I'm just inviting people to, to go through these, um, re-listen to this podcast and, and go through those three and understand that only by addressing them in that contemplative state, in that alpha theta, um, can you become a better version of yourself and why not? Um, and Dr. Martinez, what I wanted to do with the remaining time we have is sometimes an example of you know how those antidotes have been applied to a and you don't have to use it like a person um, in your practice because you know we don't want to have anything that's um, you know confidential, but just sort of a structural example. Let's take the abandonment that um, that person that feels cold with the vascular constriction, feeling of isolation and disconnection. You know, maybe they have a low immune system. I, I chose that for the. This was a fabulous uh, interview that can be listened to at any time. But while we're recording this interview, we are in the middle of the coronavirus. Um, epidemic um, or pandemic. And because of the low immune system issue at, related to that abandonment, I thought it would be wonderful just to kind of paint a picture of if anyone does feel that, Dr. Martinez, how could they sort of in a case example kind of way start to practice that commitment so that they can raise their immune system up, which is so important this time. And then of course, we'll finish um, giving you time to allow people because there's so much more in the book um, information where they can go to your website to find more about your work, to find the book and so on. So how does that sound for a way to conclude the interview, sort of case examples sure. around, around the abandonment and boosting our immune system and then information about find, finding more about your work? Very good. And, and also on the corona, I wrote an article in, in Media Magazine that uh, <clears throat> you might want to share. Uh, it's, been, it's been read by over 40,000 people already. So it's really uh, proliferating faster than the virus, fortunately. <laughs> uh, but really, <clears throat> what happens with the, uh, uh, especially the, the the corona, is that it's a virus, and, and a virus attacks uh, and the body, especially the upper respiratory system, and the immune system is the one that has to take care of it. There's no vaccine, there's no antiviral for that. But <clears throat> we know that IgA's, which is one of the five uh, antibodies, immunoglobulin uh, type A, it's in the saliva and it's in the, in the uh, blood, and they specifically fight upper respiratory viruses. And one way to bring the IgAs up is with a technique that I've developed and that other people use, but I use it specifically for IgAs, 
is that you go into that contemplative state and you allow, and, and by the way, what brings up the IGAs psychoneurologically is an awareness of compassion, embodiment of compassion. So what you do is you do a, uh, the contemplative state, you go into a relaxed state and beyond stay, the relaxing, and then you begin to bring back memories of times that you have been compassionate with yourself, that someone has been compassionate with you, or that you have observed an act of compassion. And every time that you remember it, you embody it. And within 15 minutes, you begin to increase IGAs. So if you have the, the virus, it'll help you fight the virus. If you don't have the virus, it'll help you prevent the virus because it increases your IGAs. And they last up to about six hours. So it's good to do it two or three times a day in a time of a crisis. Mm, that's beautiful. And so what you're saying is say you get into a contemplative state and you just kind of you kind of go through like memories of maybe helping somebody else of of offering support whether it's emotional or any kind of support to others is are those kind of examples of of um remembering those compassionate moments yes and compassionate moments with you too uh that you yourself okay. for example uh and one compassionate moment would be i kept my word that i was going to stay away from the news for three days and i kept it that's compassion that's a caring for you uh, but when you see an act of compassion and when you feel an act of compassion, sometimes you get goosebumps. It's a very powerful emotion. And that emotion has to do with secre secreting immune uh, antibodies that help you against viruses. So interesting. But you were saying about abandonment, um, a, um, a, a particular uh, example you, you were thinking? Oh yeah. So if you worked with a client that, that had that issue and just sort of a, a process of working with them to resolve that. And like you said, even like feeling more warmth in the body, I mean, just kind of painting a specific example, I think would be really great for, for viewers and listeners. Okay. And I'll give you an example how you, if you only take just part of it, it doesn't work. Sometimes you can do some Tibetan techniques when a person has that, that circulatory problem with, uh, with coldness. And you could get them to warm up, but then they go back and they get cold again because it's something you're just moving temperature. You're not moving the essence of the temperature. So the important thing about the wounds is that they are usually caused by people that mean something to you, by what I call culture editors, people that have power in a particular context from the culture that gives them power, like a mother at home, father at home, uh, teacher in school, especially doctor in clinics and hospitals and uh, clergy and temples and, uh, and, and uh, churches. And we're designed to pay much attention to that. So then what happens is that you learn abandonment from a, a father that you love very much. Not only do you get abandoned, but you entangle abandonment with love. Love for you is abandonment. So then you speak abandonment fluently and you find people that abandon you or you find people that you abandon and it continues the process and it continues the damage. So when you do the work with, let's say, abandonment, you want to find out, all right, wh who taught me abandonment? It's not even who, who wounded, but who taught me abandonment and who is supporting my abandonment now and how am I supporting my abandonment now and who's supporting it now is what I call the co-authors of your world. Because if that's not addressed, then you're looking at the symptom and not the cause. Once you do that, you have, you, then the technique is to untangle love from abandonment or to untangle it from shame or, or betrayal. And then have a different dialogue and interaction with your co-author who, for example, continues to abandon you. And uh, in one particular case, let's say that a person has a, an abandonment uh, issue and they're with a partner that, the bad partner abandons emotionally. Partner's not there when the, the person needs him. And they realize that uh, it's not, not to blame, to realize how powerful we are to apply what we learn that's bad, but how powerful we are to apply what we learn that's good. So it's both. Uh, then you do the technique and you clean up the abandonment and you begin to create commitment consciousness. And one of the commitment consciousness would include committing to not letting someone abandon me like that. And, and anytime that you work through a wound or one of the dampers, you have to create new boundaries. You have to create new boundaries because co-authors are not going to be ready for you to change just because you want to change. So um, 
if, for example, you have worked on the abandonment and your partner abandons you emotionally, uh, you need that person emotionally and they're too busy for you. Well, that, that needs to be addressed. That needs to be addressed. Not when you're arguing, because when you're arguing, it's like talking to a, to a drunk about not drinking. You're talking to the bottle. <laughs> so when you're arguing, you're talking to the anger. When you're, not ang- when you're not angry, you talk about it. Look, I have this situation in my life, and I'm trying to work this out. And this is what I'm going to do when you don't respond to me. And usually, if the other person is open, <clears throat> open, then you can say, how about you? Do you have any kinds of issues related to that? And you will find that they do. One abandons because they're afraid of being shamed or they're abandoned because they're afraid of being betrayed. So and then they, and that's what guardians of the heart is all about for partners to work on what they're dumping into the relationship and working on the ad- antidote. So let's say this person has the abandonment, the partner is abandoning because they have a shame issue. So then when you work it through, you have a relationship that's based on commitment and honor consciousness, and then you begin to heal both. Mm, that's so beautiful. I mean, and what it does too, is I love this idea around the boundaries and saying like, you know, because it's Dr. Martinez, we know that we can't change other people. We can only change ourselves. That's right. Um, but what you're saying is that by saying that I have these boundaries, if I feel like I'm somebody that's abandoned, this is what I'm going to do when I feel that I'm being abandoned. And so there's just kind of a, you're not waiting for some external thing to change. You're saying, this is what I'm going to do, but you're also inviting a conversation so that partner can, they can understand more about their archetypes or their, you know, their dampeners. And, and then, and then it's just a dialogue so that everyone can start to work on things because I think it all really just starts with awareness, right? First, we have to be yes. aware of these things. Your then, it's, then there's commitment think, uh, and then there's, <clears throat> oh, go ahead. Ahead. I was just say, then there's these techniques that you have in the book. So it's kind of a, a multi-step thing, but having things along the way where the, where the, the control point can be within so that you don't have to rely on others. You can change your own language. You can do self-commitment. You can, you know, come, you can go to this alpha theta state on your own and, and, and have compassion to self. These are all things you can do, but to take it to the next level, it's about doing it as a, as a, um, a, a bigger unit or as a partnership to, to go deeper on both sides. Yes. And, and, and you have to, <clears throat> once you work it through, then you have to go, <clears throat> excuse me, to the boundary setting. And it has two parts, setting the boundary and giving people permission to not like it. <clears throat> so I'll give you an example. This person was shamed and, um, uh, she had an uncle who was very shaming and she wouldn't call him because every time she called the first time, Oh, so you haven't had time for me. Oh, and it's shaming. <clears throat> so, so once she learned the dialogue, this is how it went again, setting limits, changing the language and having fun, by the way, having fun with it. <clears throat> so she called, she said, I feel like I need to call him. And, uh, and, and she had a new language now. So he did the predictable thing. Co-authors are very predictable. And she said, hi, uncle, how are you? Well, it's about time. It's been three months since you called me. And the response was, I'm so amazed at the way that you can keep time. That is beautiful. I love it. (laughs) And then he he keeps on. Well, it's not beautiful to me. Well, that's all right. Uh, I called you because I wanted to tell you how much I love you. Well, I'm very concerned about the time. No, no, you already established it. You're really good at keeping time. What else do you want to do? You break the software. And then if they say, well, I'm very angry with you. All right, that's okay. I called you to be happy with you. So when you're not angry with me, call me back and we'll talk. And be, make sure you keep time, you know. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, thank you so much for bringing the fun factor into it. Because that's I, I had not thought about how setting boundaries and creating a new dialogue, especially in these very sensitive areas, could actually be fun. But what you just described is absolutely a fun thing. It's like, okay, when... You know, when something's coming at you and you're ready, right, with a proactive stance, then you can have a little bit of, you know, fun with your, with your, you know, your response. Yes. yes. There was, uh, if we have time, I can tell you something very quickly. Absolutely. Uh, in Nashville, I worked with a lot of uh, uh, some country music stars that appear to make it overnight and they don't, they work very hard. <clears throat> but this person made it very big and he came from a very humble uh, town. And at first he went back and it was a, a hero from Nashville. 
But after a while, they start cutting your clay feet and they start bringing you down. So every time he would go back, oh, so you don't have any time for us. You have to be in, in, in the city of the devil in Nashville. And well, what does he do then to go back to the tribe? Because you're not careful. You go back to the tribe wounded. That's the only way they can take you back. So he started drinking excessively. And he said something really terrible about the CEO of the, of the uh, company, that the publisher that contracted with him. He lost uh, the contract. It went down. And anyway, so he got back. But here was the, uh, the dialogue that he learned after the shaming. He, no, by the way, he's not an alcoholic. He just had problems drinking. And he's a social drinker now. He's doing well. Got another contract. But the dialogue was, <clears throat> um, you never explain yourself. Because if you do, you're giving more ammunition. So the father who was a pastor and a, and a God-fearing man, you have to be careful with the God-fearing people because they put fear into you. And it's not God, it's, it's you. Um, so he would go back and the dialogue would come. Oh, so now you're back. So you were an alcoholic, you came back. And now that you're doing well again, you don't have any time for us. You don't have any time for us, right? And he said, yeah, I don't. But now that I made time for you, what do you want to do with it? Ah, okay. So he was ready with that dialogue. Yes. So again, proactive. And it's a own. little playful. Yeah, that's right. You make them own what they're doing to you. He said, well, no, I don't know. I don't know if I need anything from you because you don't have any time for us. You're right. I don't, but I have time for you now. So what would you like now? You know what mm. I would like? I'd really have a good, like to have a good time with you. What about you? And he said that there was a blank and then, and then his father smiled and hugged him. Mm. <laughs> Oh, that's so powerful. And it's so timely because I think a lot of us right now are, are feeling like, you know, if we've got kids that have left the nest and then they're back. Right. And so it's like, we're all trying to figure out how to communicate in a loving way. So I think everything we've talked about today is not only wonderful for the, the long term in terms of helping listeners throughout their lives, but for this short term with what we're experiencing with the coronavirus, I think the the awareness around the immune system and the, and I'm going to link to your article. So I'm going to give you an opportunity just to list places where people can find you and follow your work. And of course, get your book because there's all these practices in the book to address the archetypes that we've talked about. But um, yeah, I'll also link to that article. So I'm going to let you go ahead and give your websites. Yes. The website is a very simple biocognitive, one word, biocognitive.com. And in, on Facebook, where the article, I have a link for the article, but I have a lot of free information on, on my Facebook page. It's Dr. Mario Martinez, and the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the address is uh, uh, facebook.com, then uh, forward slash mind body culture. And you can get their videos, and there's all kinds of information there that I would suggest you go completely free. And the book is available everywhere, but Amazon is probably the best. Uh, and um, then uh, that's it. That's what, that's what's going on. Fantastic. All right. Well, I will put all of those links in the show notes and um, I want to thank you. You are such an inspiration. I have absolutely loved this conversation and I know that it's going to help a lot of people. So thank you again for your wonderful work in this world. Thank you. My pleasure. And uh, congratulations on the work you did. Thank you. Gracias. Por nada. Have a nice day. <laughs> Bye-bye.